Graham. Good morning to all of you. This is an awesome meeting. And uh, before I start, I would like to beg your indulgence to thank two persons. Harvey Feinberg, where are you, Harvey? Put up your hand. Oh. <laughs> I had the pleasure of working with Harvey. Uh, you know, thank you, Harvey, for what you have done as the president of IOM, helping WHO to review our performance for the 2009-2010 uh, H1N1 pandemic and presented a very important report. So, you know, the unfortunate thing is political leaders did not take it up and uh, failed to listen to that wake-up call. And of course, you know, Ebola came. I want to thank your current president, Victor, Victor Zhao, along with other reviewed uh, on WHO's and others' performance, uh, you know, with uh, Peter Sen as the chair of that report, the best of all the reviews. Now, I mean, you know, I hope the power of this very important institution in USA and beyond, because you have many uh, members of, uh, you know, IOM and now uh, NAM from different parts of the world. We need to make sure that political leaders do not forget about this wake-up call. And quoting Jim Kim, what he used to say is, there are so many um, priorities on the agenda or on the uh, a screen of uh, leaders, they vacillate between fear and neglect. So we must maintain the momentum in the interest of people, as you put it, Victor, in the interest of humanity, we must continue to make the cry and the call, call out to people, speak the truth unto power. As one of you mentioned, one of your awardees is so important. Public health is not getting the attention and the investment it deserves. So let me first and foremost encourage you to continue to do that and thank you so much for inviting me to join you and share with you some of our thoughts on this dreadful disease. Victor, thank you again for your invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, the world has 800 million chronically hungry people, but it also has countries where more than 70% of the adult population is obese or overweight. Until the late 20th century, dietary issues in developing countries focus on the health consequences of undernutrition especially stunting and wasting in children and anemia in women of childbearing age. That situation has changed dramatically. In just a few decades, the world has moved from a nutrition profile in which the prevalence of underweight was more than double that of obesity to the current situation in which more people worldwide are obese than underweight. Once considered the companions of uh, rich societies, obesity and overweight are now on the rise in low and middle income countries, particularly in urban areas where the increase is fastest. Since 1980, Dabikto estimates that the worldwide preference of obesity has more than doubled with significant increases seen in every region. When I say every region, of course, it's the six regions of the World Health Organization. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of overweight children grew from 4 million in the year 1990 to 10 million in 2012. Though adiposity is increasing everywhere, the epidemiology differs according to the age of the obesity epidemic. In North America and Europe, the prevalence of obesity is highest among low-income groups who often live in urban areas blighted by food deserts and littered with fast food outlets. In countries more recently affected by the obesity epidemic, as in the Asia-Pacific region, obesity is seen first 
in wealthy urban residents, and then later in impoverished rural areas and urban slums. This shift, this shift to population-wide obesity is occurring with terrifying speed. In Mexico City, adult obesity increased from 16% of the city's population in the year 2000 to 26%, 26% in 2012. By that year, 35% of the city's children aged 5 to 11 years were obese or overweight. For the country as a whole, 7 out of 10 Mexicans are now overweight, with a third of them clinically obese. In India, the prevalence of overweight increased from 9.7% near the turn of the century to nearly 20% in studies reported after 2010. For children and adolescents, these studies show that obesity and overweight are rapidly increasing, not just in the higher income groups, but also in the rural poor, where undernutrition and underweight remain major health concerns. Many other rapidly developing countries show a similar pattern. Obesity and undernutrition can occur side by side in the same country, the same household, and of course, the same community. In China, the country I know a little better, as decades of food scarcity were replaced by abundance, the prevalence of obesity and overweight more than doubled during the last decades of the 20th century, moving from famine to feasting in less than a generation. In 2012, China's Minister of Health estimated that as many as 300 million Chinese were obese in a population of 1.2 billion. China, with the world's second largest economy, now is competing with the US as the nation with the largest number of overweight citizens. This is not the kind of comparison we would encourage. <laughs> or a competition, as I said. Earlier this year, The Lancet published a polled analysis of trends. Trends in adult body mass index in 200 countries from 1975 to 2014. In 1974, the study estimated that 105 million adults worldwide were obese. By 2014, the number had grown. It has grown to 640 million, more than a six-fold increase. And this is more than half a billion people. The analysis reached a stunning overarching conclusion. If post-year 2000 trends continue, the probability of reaching the global obesity sub-target set by WHO member states is, and allow me to quote, virtually zero. The target itself is comparatively modest. By 2025, to hold the rise in the prevalence of obesity to its 2010 level, this is truly very modest. And this means, basically, to keep a very bad situation from getting much worse. And it is a bad situation, ladies and gentlemen. It is a slow motion disaster. Population-wide increases in body weight are the warning signal that big trouble is on its way. It takes time, but trouble eventually arrives as a wave of lifestyle-related chronic diseases. Cardiovascular diseases are now the leading killers worldwide. Victor, you are a leader in that area, and you know very well. In the developing world, heart attacks tend to kill abruptly, with no lingering burden on the health system. For cancer, the most devastating diagnosis in most cultures, 70% of patients in resource-constrained settings are diagnosed so late that pain relief is the only treatment option. No radiotherapy, no chemotherapy, no surgery. No advanced treatments costing around $150,000 per 
per patient per year. Who can afford that? Obesity, ladies and gentlemen, contributes to the risk for cardiovascular diseases and some cancers. But the role of adiposity as an independent risk factor is strongest for diabetes. Moreover, diabetes with its costly complications, including blindness, limb amputations, and the need for dialysis can place an extraordinary long-term burden on health budgets and household finances. In rural parts of some Asia-Pacific countries, a diabetic can spend more than a third of total household income on the cost of care. In several countries, the cost of caring for diabetes alone can absorb 20% of the entire health budget. The International Diabetes Federation estimates that the cost of caring for diabetes worldwide was at least, stay, stay put, is at least 673 billions in 2015. Can you imagine the amount of money spent on one disease alone? With these trends as a background, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make two points. First, despite multiple efforts on multiple fronts, no country in the world has managed to turn its obesity epidemic around in all age groups. Second, these trends ask us to think about what progress in the 21st century really means. Economic growth and modernization, historically associated with better health outcomes, are actually opening wide the entry point for the globalized marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages, and the switch from active to sedentary lifestyles. For the first time in history, rapidly growing prosperity is making many previously poor people sick. This is happening in countries with few resources and health system capacities to respond. If current trends continue, a costly disease like diabetes can devour the gains of economic development. Ladies and gentlemen, diabetes is one of the biggest global health crises of the 21st century. WHO estimates that the number of adults living with diabetes has almost quadrupled since 1980, moving from 108 million in 1980 to 422 million in 2014. More than half of these people were unaware of their disease status, and even more received no treatment. The global prevalence of diabetes in the adult population has also increased, nearly doubling from 4.7% in 1980 to 85 in 2014. Diabetes is no longer a disease associated with affluence. It is on the rise nearly everywhere. Like population-wide obesity, its precursor, Diabetes is increasing most markedly in the cities of low and middle income countries. Most people are affected by type 2 diabetes, once known as adult onset diabetes, but no longer, as so many adolescents and children are now affected. Each year, diabetes kills around 1.5 million deaths. High blood glucose contributes to an estimated 2.2 million deaths largely by increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease. That means 3.7 million yearly deaths related to high glucose levels. Of these deaths, 43% occur prematurely before the age of 70. The Asia Pacific region is generally considered the epicenter of the diabetes crisis. In these countries, people develop the disease earlier, get sicker, and die sooner than their counterparts in wealthier countries. Some researchers are investigating whether a genetic predisposition may be at work. Others are looking for factors in the environment that could amplify a genetic risk. 
or operate on their own to explain this unique epidemiological pattern. Evidence is mounting. Mounting that, you know, bodies programmed during gestation and in early childhood to survive on low energy intake are metabolically challenged when confronted with even modest increase in calorie intake. Some researchers believe this may be one reason why people in India and China developed diabetes about a decade earlier than those in your European countries and can do so following only a small weight gain. In some of Asia's most populous countries, a generation that grew up in rural poverty with too little to eat and jobs involving hard manual labor now lives in urban high-rise apartments with sedentary jobs, low-cost cars, and food environments loaded with cheap and convenient calories. Partly as a result of these changes, millions of people lifted out of poverty to join the booming middle class now find themselves trapped, trapped in the misery of diabetes and all its costly complications. According to 2015 statistics published by the International Diabetes Federation, India has nearly 70 million adults living with diabetes, with one million deaths estimated for that year alone, with the prevalence of overweight at nearly 20%. The situation is certain to get worse. The most alarming diabetes news comes from China. In 2013, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a report by Chinese researchers on the prevalence and control of diabetes in their country. Based on the findings of a large national survey, the authors estimated that China has 114 million adults living with diabetes representing a prevalence in the adult Chinese population of nearly 12%. Less than a third of those surveyed were aware of their conditions, and only a quarter reported receiving treatment. In its most shocking finding, the study estimated that nearly half of the entire adult Chinese population are pre-diabetes amounting to an additional 493 million people at risk of this debilitating disease with all its costly complications. Think about, think about what this means for the world's second largest economy. Yeah, good prosperity, growth, but full of sick people. Looking for an explanation, the authors suggested that modernization and rising incomes were propelling rapid lifestyle changes, including a shift from traditional healthy diets to westernized diets. Widespread media coverage of the alarming report prompted a Chinese newspaper to run a cartoon, a cartoon showing a patient with his doctor. And the patient, the anxious patient was asking, doctor, is there a cure for diabetes? And the doctor says, yes, poverty. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, diabetes can be successfully managed, especially when detected early. WHO has international guidelines for doing so, including insulin and blood glucose lowering drugs on our model list of essential medicines as a reference, as a recommendation to many countries, in particularly the developing nations. Even better, diabetes can be prevented, ideally through population-wide interventions, changing the environment in which people make their lifestyle choices requires extraordinary government commitment, courage, and persistence. The Lancet 2015 Obesity Series points the finger at the international food system as the principal driver of the global obesity epidemic. In addition, 
Obesogenic environments are shaped by international trade policies, agricultural subsidies, heavy advertising, also to children, politically powerful lobbies, and money invested to distort, to distort the scientific evidence. We have seen this most recently with a report on how the sugar industry artificially sweetened nutritionists in a very prestigious university here in US back in the 60s to downplay the role of sugar in disease. In the second half of the previous century, the world's food system began to concentrate almost exclusively on increasing the production and reducing the cost of food. Food production became industrialized. Techniques were developed to grow vegetables without soil, confined animal feeding operations sprung up to meet the growing demand for cheap meat and dairy products. In 2000 and the 2005 report of the Peel Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production, and the report was titled, Putting Meat on the Table, and the report exposed the dire consequences of industrial meat farms for the development of in countries affecting the environment, human health, animal welfare, and rural America. The report is generally considered the most profound explanation on why factory meat production is dangerous, and it is dangerous for health, and it is dangerous for sustainability. Unfortunately, many middle-income countries with a booming middle class, as in Brazil, China, and India, have adopted factory farming models from North America and Europe to meet the growing consumer demand for meat that nearly always follows new prosperity. For example, China now has single mega factory farms capable of producing more than a million pigs every year. While consolidating meat production undoubtedly improves food safety, it is environmentally unsustainable. And it comes at a time when WHO and other health agencies are advising populations to reduce meat consumption as a strategy for preventing non-communicable diseases. For all these reasons, much food production is now divorced from its primary purpose. Primary purpose of providing the nutrients that sustain human life in good health. Following a series of high-profile mergers and acquisitions, Agribusiness is now a global industrial complex operated by just a handful of large multinational corporations that could, I mean, that control the food chain from seeds, feed, and chemicals to production, processing, and marketing, and of course, distribution. The dominance and power of this industrial complex are immense. They help explain why highly processed junk food is becoming the new global food staple. They are crowding out an ancient food system maintained by smallholder and backyard farmers, especially women, that has long fed millions of people in Africa and Asia. Municipal governments authorities now find it cheaper to import processed foods than to gather fresh produce from the hinterlands. The food industry resists interference from a health agency like Dabek Joe, and it has the power to do so. In a wonderful, you know, in a world, a wonderful world, yes, but full of so many uncertainties, economic, trade, and industry considerations can dominate national and international agendas and override the best interests of public health, the best interests of all the excellent work that you are doing. But we are seeing some progress, some good progress. In 2013, 
the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which is a joint function of FAO and WHO, mandated the disclosure of total sugars, sodium, and saturated fat in its international guidelines for food labeling. One of the strongest recommendations of the WHO Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity, thank you, Nancy, for mentioning that commission, calls on governments to implement an effective tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. WHO recommends that to be effective, a tax should increase the price by at least 20%. By the way, have you seen a leaked document? A leaked document from a, a, a big company that sell um, soda? They have a strategy to kill the sugar tax. Stay tuned. I like lo leaked documents sometimes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity, uh, the report, further urged governments to accept their responsibility to protect children, including a responsibility to take action without considering the impact on producers of unhealthy foods and beverages. The often heard argument that lifestyle behaviors are a matter of personal choice does not apply to children. Obesity in children is society's fault, not theirs. Last year, WHO issued new guidelines for free sugars, recommending that they count for less than 10% of total energy intake. A further reduction to less than 5% of total energy was recommended to bring additional health benefits. That guideline prompted South America with its obesity epidemic, and the Philippines, where 97% of six-year-olds have tooth decay, to seek WHO guidance in drafting appropriate legislation to, sh uh, to tax sugar-sweetened beverages. These countries join U.S. cities, like Berkeley and Philadelphia, which are already taxing soda. Next month, I heard that three more cities will vote on a proposed tax. I wish them all the best. Giving consumer transparent and useful information also helps. And I commend U.S. authorities for their efforts to include in the country's nutrition facts labels, not just total sugars, but also added sugars. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a final comment. When crafting preventive strategies, government officials must recognize that the widespread occurrence of obesity and diabetes throughout a population is not, is not, I have to emphasize, a failure of individual willpower to resist fats and sweets or exercise more. It is a failure of political will to take on powerful economic operators like the food and soda industries. If governments understand this, and if governments understand their duty, the fight against obesity and diabetes can be won. The interests of the public must be prioritized over those of corporations. I thank you.